Hello, my friends. Thank you so much for joining me for this uh, podcast episode. I want to build it for you here in just a second. Thank you. If you are watching on YouTube or Rumble, if you don't mind, if you would subscribe to those platforms, that will help us to reach more people organically, and I really would appreciate it. Also, if you want to listen to this episode, you're welcome to do that. Go on our website. The title of it is, Dear Parents, Will You Stop Arguing, Please? I'm going to share with you a, a letter written by a teenage young man who is appealing to his parents to stop arguing. This is something that's been really important to me. We do a lot of, we respond to a lot of people that come to our ministry where husbands and wives do not get along. And so we, we try the best that we can to help people and we produce a, a lot of content. And so I want to do this one from a child's perspective, what they are hearing when their parents refuse to get along and how it impacts the child. And then hopefully maybe uh, it will impact the parents to where they will have a desire to walk out repentance. And so again, if you want to listen or read the actual letter I'm going to share with you, you can go to our website, look for Dear Parents, Will You Stop Your Arguing, Please. Thanks again so much for watching. When children are young, they believe their parents are impressive in about every way. And then as they grow older, they begin to develop proper categories for living well with each other. And they begin to see their parents' good and bad behaviors. Now they can wordsmith. They can understand what they're looking at in a way that they couldn't when they were much younger as the parents were the big people in the room doing all these amazing things. Observing flawed lives in the family dynamic does not have to be harmful to the children if the parents consistently clean up their messes by active repentance. However, Suppose the husband and wife are not modeling a practical picture of Christ and his church while repenting along the way. In that case, it can have a detrimental impact on their children, even pushing them away from the family and pushing them away from Christ. Biffy was one of those kids, as you are about to hear from the letter that he wrote his dad a week before he left for college. Hello everyone, this is Rick Thomas. You're listening to the Life Over Coffee podcast. I'm so glad that you are here. If you want to read Biffy's letter, you can go on our website and you can find this article that I have developed for you. The title of it is, Dear Parents, Will You Stop Arguing, Please? You can read the entire uh, letter uh, and the article that I have here for you. You can listen to the podcast, of course, and you can watch the video. All of these things are embedded in this one resource. It is true when children are smaller, their parents are quite impressive. They are the big people in the room. They can do amazing things. They can drive automobiles. They can prepare food. They can go shopping for food. They can tell the time. They can uh, schedule appointments. They can meet with people. There are so many wonderful things that parents can do, and kids are just like really in awe at the what appears to be the omnipotence of the parents. But then as these children grow older, and they do develop these categories, they become more perceptive. They have ways of understanding things that they couldn't when they were the little people in the room. And as they grow older, they begin to realize that maybe our parents aren't as great or as impressive as I thought that they were initially. That's typically when the parent, when the kids start becoming teenagers. Uh, as I've said often, that children have ingrown baloney detectors, and they can tell when parents are full of baloney. This is why you want to have active repentance, because we can't live perfect parental lives. We can't live any kind of perfected life. We are going to make mistakes, but that is okay. Christians have a secret weapon. We can repent. We can get back on track. But there are some families, there are some parents 
that do not get back on track. They do not actively repent. Therefore, they live this dualistic, convoluted, confusing life, and it does have an adverse impact on children. It is okay to sin. Please hear me in context of what I'm saying. It is okay to make mistakes if you humbly acknowledge them, repent of them, and aggressively work not to repeat them again. That is a part of the Christian experience. But if we do not own our mistakes, there will be repercussions, and those repercussions roll downhill, and they will affect the little people in the room. And there is a good chance if parents have not been actively repenting throughout their lives as they have been rearing these kids, when these kids do become teenagers and their ingrown baloney detectors are now redlining, meaning they are just going off because they know that their parents are hypocrites. Well, they are going to respond in negative ways, and that is exactly what happened to Biffy. Now, this is a fictional letter. It's not a true letter, but I will say this. After 25 years of doing counseling, everything that I am going to share with you in Biffy's fictional letter there is truth here. And if the Spirit of God convicts you in any way as a parent, but also as an angry teenager, don't miss that point as well. I was one of those angry teenagers who felt righteous. I took the moral high ground because of all the evil of my parents. And I I did not understand what it meant to be a victim and to cast my victimness on Christ. I didn't know Christ. And so I took the moral high ground and angrily judged my parents for all the sin that they did, not realizing that it was having a ricochet effect on me. It was damaging my own soul. And so if you are a teenager and your parents have been hypocrites along the way, they haven't been active repenters, don't think that you can get out of this unscathed. It will affect you. You can't take the role of the un the unblemished victim. Yeah, you have been victimized, but you have a responsibility to respond to Christ because of the suffering that has been brought into your life. You cannot you cannot justify or rationalize any sin that you do because someone has sinned against you. And so if there's any conviction to be felt, whether it's the husband or the wife, the parents, or the angry teenagers, please let the Holy Spirit have his way and do what you need to do to change. Here's the letter from Biffy to his dad a week before he left for college. Dad, I started to share these things with you the other night after you arrived home, but you seemed to be your usual preoccupied and disinterested self, so I let it go. Honestly, I don't even know where to start, and I'm unsure how to write what I want to say. It's somewhat complicated, and I'm nearly, well, I'm almost apathetic at this point. And then I thought, I'll just start writing and see what happens, and so here it is. I know, it's long but it's what came out. And let me be honest, I am afraid to say some of these things to your face, which is why I'm banging them out on the computer. I hope you will read it because I'm laying it out and I'm not sure I'll ever do this again. I'm heading to college next week, so I figured now's the time. I've seen the anger you have shown to mom, and I'd rather not be in your sight line after you see this letter. I'm not saying your anger is all your fault. I know it's not. But I don't want you to yell at me the way that you yell at her. Many times in children's lives, when there is unrepented anger, whether it's from the dad or the mom, the children just learn to keep their head down. They just learn to stay out of out of harm's way. And so they live these uh, quashed, these truncated lives, these lesser lives, because they are diminished and they stay diminished intentionally because they don't want to get hit in the head with any of the, the vocal grenades that the dad or the mom launches across the room. And that's what Biffy is sta saying here. He has experienced the anger of his dad so many times that he's just keeping his head down. He goes on and says, next week I'll be 18. And even if you don't receive this well, it might be worth a final shot. I know you don't like to talk face-to-face -face either. 
eye contact has never been your thing. And just so I'm clear, though you might not believe it, I do love both of you. I mean, you're the only parents I have. Minimally, I hope this will make things better for the siblings. We talk about these things. We have talked a lot through the years. It's like we have two families, my screwed up parents and your weird kids who are trying to figure out things by themselves. Bryce is the most scared. He told me the other day that he never knows if you and mom will stay together from one day to the next. He assumes he'll come home one day and, and one of you will be gone. He hates the thought of me leaving for college. I used to think the way he did when, when I was his age. I heard you tell mom to leave, and I heard her say similar things to you. Dad, we don't know what to do with that. There are two critical things that parents can provide for their children. One of those is security, protection, security and protection, and the other one is love, an environment of grace in which they can flourish and grow. A loving home. I'm not talking about a perfect home. I'm talking about a, a loving home where encouragement is the theme, where joy is the theme. They know that they are loved. They know that they are cared for. It kind of reminds me of what Paul said in Romans 8.31, if God is for you, who can be against you? He was talking to the Roman Christians when he penned those words, and they were being crucified at the stake. They were being murdered by the culture, but as long as they knew that God was for them, who could be against them? And Paul wanted them to hear that message loud and clear, knowing that their lives were about to be extinguished, some of them, many of them, they wanted, he wanted them to be bolstered and secured, knowing that God is for them. Children can persevere through a lot knowing that their parents love them. And so one of the most critical things that a parent can gift to their children is objective, measurable love. Not just in word only, but word is important, as Biffy's saying here, that his dad cannot even look them in the eye and have a vulnerable, humble conversation. He's too proud. He's too angry. He can't show that kind of weakness. And Biffy's brother Bryce is not sure if he is loved, and that creates the insecurity the other thing that kids need. They need that protective care. They need a secure environment. A, a plant, think of children like tender plants. They cannot grow uh, when they are not protected, when they are insecure, when there is yelling and throwing and, and just cutting remarks, just being tossed around the room. As Biffy said here, Dad, we do not know what to do with that. Don't you know we can hear you yelling through the bedroom walls? Do you think closing the door makes things safer or quieter? We have listened to so many of your conversations. It's painful. The way you react to each other is why I have Maggie. She had made things, she has made things a lot better for me. She cares for me. Do you see what Biffy's saying here? This is the country song. He is looking for love in all the wrong places because this is what he wants. He wants love and security. And because he is not experiencing in his, in his home, and he's saying Bryce is feeling the same way, well, when Bryce gets older, he's going to follow Biffy's path, whether it's by connecting with a girl like Maggie here, which Biffy has done, or finding other ways in which he can feel affection or feel security. Biffy goes on to say, she's made things a lot better for me. She cares for me. And before you blow your stack, we haven't done anything dumb yet. Safe sex has been as far as we have gone. Do you see not just the rationalizations, where he has made safe sex okay. Fornication is okay. He's made it okay because he's justified it. He's rationalized it because, again, Biffy is a victim. This is what I was saying earlier. This letter here is not just for Biff and Mabel, the parents, but it's also for Biffy because sometimes we can get so inculcated in our victimness that we do not see the reality of the decisions that we are making and we can justify evil things because 
we have a victim-centered mentality. Yes, I heard that fight too. Uh, Mom said she wished she had never married you, knowing that all you wanted was to, quote, jump her bones. What Biffy is saying here is that he and Maggie are having safe sex, and he heard Biff and Mabel have that same fight. They fornicated too, is what Biffy is saying. Oh, and by the way, I'm not a mistake, as you told her during one of your fights. Maggie is not like you at all. She loves to be loved, and I like it when she loves me back. What he just described here are two empty love cups, but that is the nature of lust. That is the nature of insecure kids who are looking for love because they have been depleted uh, by the lack of protective security in the home that their parents did not provide, nor those loving relationships. And so Maggie comes from a similar background. She loves to be loved, and I like it too when she loves me back, Biffy said. We're good for each other. She has been my salvation. Now a synonym for salvation here is idol, idolatry. She is my idol. She's the one who saves me, he says, which is great because I gave up a long time ago on you ever being my hero. And mom hasn't had it together forever. I can't remember when I gave up on her. I'll be okay, though. I, I wish you both would get some help for the rest of the kids. I have someone. We talk all the time. She's a good listener. She has even motivated me to finish school. She wants to go to college next year, and I figured I'd better get my grades up or I won't be able to go with her. Little sis has a crush on Bart Jones, by the way. You know, the kid who came to her birthday party wearing all black. You were mean to him. But he seems like a nice enough kid. He's lonely and she is shy, so they hit it off. His dad split from his mom when he was three, so he doesn't know what it's like to have a dad either. He's weird, but Bethina is good for him. She can help him. She's bossy enough when she gets comfortable with someone. Don't tell her I told you about Bart. She made me promise that I would not tell you, but she also busted me on the weed thing, so this is payback. Do you see the pattern that these children are taking? His little brother, Bryce, is very much insecure, and he will probably fall into this same path of looking for love so that he can feel secure and have, uh, have someone to care for him. Well, little sister already has a crush. And by the way, this is the collision of two more love cups because Bart Jones, who doesn't have a dad and is deeply insecure and unloved, well, he has set up an idol in, in Biffy's little sister, Biffina. Anyway, she just got her license and she needs to start fending for herself. We have pretty much raised ourselves all of our lives, always looking for someone to care about us. You spend most of your time at work, and when you're home, you and mom are arguing. It's time for Biffina to move on, and I think they're suitable for each other. Before I met Maggie, I thought I was unlovable, and so I gave up for a few years, which is why my grades went downhill. I didn't care, which also explains the cutting. You said you didn't understand, and I didn't bother to explain it to you, but since I met Maggie, things started making sense. I want to live again. She's been the best thing to ever happen to me. I, I don't think I could ever live without her. Video games were boring. Friends were a pain in the butt. And the siblings were, well, they were annoying. I know you don't want to hear why I was cutting, but I will tell you now. You see, I used to think that you and mom did not get along because of me. All your anger, all your harsh words you threw at each other made no sense. Then one night I heard you arguing about buying that bicycle I wanted when I was eight. You said it would be a cold day in hell before you spent your money on it. Mom said she would buy it with her money. I want to go back to something I was saying at the top of this podcast, that little people think that parents are are perfect and impressive in every way when they are little, before their ingrown baloney detectors mature and they realize that parents aren't perfect. And so therefore, when they are small and when parents do things that don't make sense, because the parents are perfect, the children have to interpret what they're seeing and what they're hearing. 
And because the parents are perfect in their little minds, they can only conclude that if my dad or my mom is angry, well, then it must have something to do with me. It must be, it must be me doing this because they can't fathom this idea of parents being imperfect, parents sinning. This is how little minds work. And so what Biffy is saying here, dad and mom were angry. He says, all your anger and harsh words that you threw at each other made no sense. And here's the truth that you want to think about. Nobody ever responds to facts, but we respond to our interpretation of the facts. Now, what that means in this situation is Biff is angry. That's the fact. But Biffy is not responding to the fact that Biff is angry, Biff is a sinner, that Biff has problems. He's not responding to the fact, but he is interpreting the fact. He is viewing the fact through the lens of his interpretive filter, and he has an immature, young, three-year-old interpretive filter, and it sounds like this. Dad is very angry. Dad is an authority figure. Dad is impressive in every way. Therefore, if he is angry, then it must be because I did something wrong. Do you hear what Biffy is doing? He's not responding to the fact of a sinful, angry man. He's responding to the interpretation that he has. It must be my fault. And then that was affirmed. Biffy says, I heard you arguing about buying that bicycle I wanted when I was eight. You said it would be a cold day in hell before you spent money on it. Mom said she would buy it with her money. He goes on to say, I had no idea that a dumb bicycle would cause so much trouble. I bet you don't remember it. I always regretted having it. I felt like I was the cause of you both not getting along. It was my fault. You see, again, Biffy was not responding to the fact. The fact is he has a sinful dad who has an anger problem. But because he was the little man in the room, he had an immature way of interpreting facts, and so he interpreted it wrongly. It was my fault. He says, I used to pray that God would kill me because of what I did to you both. He did kill me, so I experimented with cutting and a few other things. The cutting worked some, but the weed worked much better. There's no use for you to get ticked now because you already know I smoke weed. I need to feel better about myself, at least inside my head. Each time I cut myself, the pain escaped, and as the blood ran down my arm, it was a warm, huge relief. It's weird. I can't explain it, and I don't expect you to understand. I knew cutting and weed were masks that hid what was happening in my heart and in our home. But desperate time requires desperate measures, right? I even told a few friends. A couple of them cut too. One of them went too far. His dad is an angry man like you. They shipped him off to military school. I didn't tell you why they shipped him because I didn't want to get shipped. I don't really care what you know now. I'm out of here next week. I'm sure this is pretty heavy on you, Dad, assuming you care. If I read something like this from my kid, I think that I would freak out. But no alarms. I'm cool now. I'm sharing these things after the fact. I've worked through most of this stuff. I'm okay now. There is no way I would have shared this before, though I don't think things will go well with the siblings now. You see, here's the delusion, one of many delusions that Biffy has. One of them here, he stated, I'm okay now. No, he's not okay. He has, he has, and he is developing a former manner of life. And he is going to bring all of this former manner of life into his marriage, maybe with Maggie, if he sticks it out that long with her. And there's going to be a lot of baggage that he's going to have to work through. What Biff and Mabel have done to Biffy and Bryce and Biffina is going to be generational. He says, I'm okay now. Well, no, he's not, but that's the delusion that he wants to live in. I hope you don't overreact and start yelling at them. Perhaps you would want to try drawing them out about what they are doing rather than condemning them like you normally do. I'm on my own now. I don't need you. 
I have dreamed of this moment for many years. You screwed up my childhood, so now it's my turn to do it my way. I do hope you both get your act together because in about six years, you're going to be on your own, you and mom. There won't be anyone to blame but her and she won't have any reason to stay with you because we won't be there. Empty nesting is going to be a beast if you don't change. I don't see how you both will keep from killing each other with us not around. By the way, you're welcome to share this letter with your pastor. I started to make a copy and send it to him, but I knew you'd blow your top and I did not want the sibs to feel the brunt of whatever you might do if the good church folk found out who you really are. So don't worry, this letter is for your eyes only. Your secret is safe with me. I won't even blow the whistle to your Bible study group. What would they think if their leader what would they think of their leader if they knew the truth about what he is like at home? I guess my guess is that half of them are hypocritical as hypocritical as you are. You keep on rocking with the boys, telling them how great God is and how much you love him and love your wife and the kids. Not me. I'm out. You can keep your God and your religion. I prayed many nights asking God to help me to get me out of this mess. He never did. I can't even tell you, I can't even tell you how many times I cried like a little kid, asking God to fix my parents, change my life, kill me, give me something better than what we had. And here we are. Your life has been a powerful example of how I do not want to be when I grow up. I suppose you can thank your God for one thing. I will do it differently from you when I get married. This is the delusion that I was talking about earlier. Hopefully Biffy will see these things as he matures. If he's not a Christian, hopefully he'll become a Christian and God will give him a new set of eyes. He continues, unlike you, I will get my anger under control because I know how devastating it can be to others. Dad, I, I said at the start that I love you. I do. I'm not mad with you anymore, at least not as much as I used to be. I've moved on. You'll always be my dad. I cannot change that. You don't expect me to be in your life. I may be or I may not. I have not decided. I need time to work out a few things and creating distance is the best thing that I can do at this point. I, I do hope that one thing does come from this letter, that you and mom get some help. Biffy. The title of this podcast, the video, the article that is shared with you, Dear Parents, Will You Stop Arguing, Please? This letter is fictional. It does not represent any specific family, though everything in it is faithful to the repercussions of how some parents live their lives and the effect it can have on their children. I have counseled many families who struggle in ways that this letter communicates. Though there are many more problems I did not address, my strongest appeal is that if you see yourself in this letter, where you're, whether you're an angry child or a misguided parent, that you would seek help. And as you reflect on what you have heard, perhaps these questions that I want to share with you will aid in how you respond. You'll see that I have directed the questions to the angry teenager who is not married. As with most situations with angry parents, they have a former manner of life, as I was talking about earlier, that they have brought into their marriage. Biffy's dad did not just become a dysfunctional parent when he had kids. That was not the point. That he, be he became an angry man. But he brought his former shaping influences into his marriage and family. If Biffy does not see, if Biffy the teenager does not see how this can happen to him, the chances of him doing similarly to his dad are very high. And so here are a few call to action thoughts that I trust will help you. Number one, what specific ways have you overreacted to how your parents parented you? What was the effect of your overreaction? If your victimization was real, have you cast those hurts on Christ or do you continue to carry those hurts? That's my concern for Biffy, that he's going to continue to carry these hurts into his marriage, maybe with Maggie. If you have not cast your victimization on Christ, what have been the adverse long-term effects of carrying the sins of others in your soul? Some of the adverse effects could be, probably are, bitterness, anger, unforgiveness, and cynicism and there are more. Number two, how have you sought salvation through other people? 
like what Biffy is doing with Maggie. If you're thinking about marriage and your motives for marriage, are your motives for marriage about what you can get from your future spouse? How are your motives set up to protect you from idolatry? Too often when people go into marriage, they look at marriage as what they can get out of it rather than what they can put into it. As you have heard with both Biffy and Maggie, they're looking to each other for what they can get from each other rather than what they can pour into the marriage for God's fame. Number three, if you are married, how is your marriage today? Are there things you must change, issues you have brought into your marriage from your disappointing childhood? Number four, if you have children, has your example, how has your example already impacted your children? If you have children, your example has impacted them. In what ways do you need to change, assuming that you need to change. The title of this podcast is Dear Parents, Will You Stop Arguing, Please? You can read this entire letter, listen to the podcast, or watch the video all inside this resource on our website.